<clears throat> I'm very happy, brothers and sisters, to have the privilege of attending this great conference with you, listening to the instructions that have been given to us by the servants of the Lord. And I thank the Lord for your friendship and your kindness to me as I visit in your various states as I tried to think what I might say to you this morning that would be of interest and inspiring, I thought I'd like to say a few words about the value of the Holy Scriptures. If we didn't have the Holy Scriptures, what would we know about our Father in heaven and His great love that gave us His only begotten Son? And what would we know about the Son and his great atoning sacrifice, and the gospel that he's given us, a pattern of life to live by, and the principles that Brother Romney has just discussed with us of where we came from and why we're here and where we're going. And without a knowledge of those things, we'd be like a ship on the ocean without a rudder or a sail or anything to guide it. We might keep afloat, but we'd never come into court. I like the words of the Savior when he said, Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye find, have eternal life, for they are they which testify of me. Is there anything more desirable to search for than eternal life, a knowledge that we can live after death with our loved ones and be exalted in the presence of our dear ones and of our Father in heaven, and of our own love, and the sanctified and the redeemed of our Father's children. I like the statement by Cicero. He said that he was more interested in the long hereafter than in the brief presence. I like that thinking. I think if all of us were more interested in the long hereafter, it would be a changed world in which we live today. I like the statement of Elizabeth Barrett Browning. She said, Earth is crammed with heaven, and every common bush of fire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit around and pluck blackberries. A lot of people in this world satisfied with plucking blackberries. And as we observe what we see around us, this marvelous creation and and everything that the Lord has created beyond the power of man to produce, uh, we can't help but realize that earth is crammed with heaven. But that doesn't tell us anything about what happens after death. That's what we get through our study of the Holy Scriptures. I like the statement of Peter of old when he said, We have a more sure word of prophecy and we do well that we cleave unto it as unto a light shining in a dark place until the day star arise in our hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in olden times by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved upon by the power of the Holy Ghost. Well, if the scriptures uh, are, uh, are come to us through the Holy Ghost and that they uh, are can't, uh, that they, well, I'll have to get over it here. It's, uh, that they are, that they're, they're, they're not to, to be understood by man alone. Uh, the scriptures would dim. Uh, They're not, um, let's see. Well, I got to get that there now. <laughs> you have to excuse me a little, I'm an old man today. <laughs> but I've got it. If the scriptures have no private interpretation, that's the word I wanted to find, then uh, if we can believe the scriptures as they are written, then we have many truths to present to the world that no one else in the world uh, can understand. I like the statement in the Book of Mormon 
we're told in three places that we should study the prophecies of Isaiah. They would all be fulfilled. And in the day of their fulfillment, it would be given to the people to understand them. Now, Isaiah, from my way of thinking, and I like to study the prophecies of Isaiah, almost lived more in our day than when he was actually here upon the earth. He saw so much of what would transpire in this dispensation. Now, for instance, uh, this prophecy of Isaiah has always appealed to me. When... Um, um, just a minute now. When Babylon was the greatest city in all the world, Isaiah prophesied that Babylon would be destroyed, it would become the abode of reptiles and wild animals, that the Arabs would no more pitch their tent there. And then he said, and Babylon should never be rebuilt. Now, can you imagine anyone today declaring that one of our great cities would be destroyed and never be rebuilt? And yet, Babylon to this day has never been rebuilt. Now, I'd like to discuss with you today a little about the 29th chapter of Isaiah. As I understand that chapter, there wasn't anybody in this world that could have understood the prophecies of Isaiah at the time that this church was organized until the Book of Mormon came forth. And through that, we have an understanding of those scriptures that no one else in the world could understand. I'd like to read a little portion commencing with the first part of the 29th chapter. Woe to Ariel, to Ariel, the city where David dwelt. Now that was Jerusalem, another name for it. Add ye year to year, let them kill sacrifice. In other words, in coming generations. And then he said, yet I shall distress Ariel, and there shall be heaviness and sorrow. That's all he had to say about the destruction of Jerusalem. But you remember what Jesus said to his 12. He told them that the temple would be destroyed. There wouldn't be one stone left upon another, and it would be plowed as an acre. But Isaiah goes from that point on to see the destruction of another great center. And he says this, and it shall be unto me as Ariel. In other words, he saw the destruction of another great center like the destruction of Jerusalem. No one in this world could have told where that other center was until the Book of Mormon came forth. And then Isaiah goes forth in his, uh, what he saw with respect to this other uh, 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 group of people. He said, I will camp against them. Uh, round about, and will lay siege against them uh, with a mount, and I will raise forts against thee, and thou shalt be brought down, and shalt speak out of the ground. Now I want you to get that. When you speak out of the ground, it's not uh, because you're alive and doing it, it's because of the record of your speech. And thy speech shall be low out of the dust, and thy voice shall be as of one that hath a familiar spirit out of the ground, and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust. Is there anything that's happened in this world to fulfill that like the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, the plates from which the Book of Mormon was translated that gives the record of the early inhabitants of this land of America back over a period of thousands of years. And then he goes on in the next verse to say it in the sixth verse, Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and with great noise, with storm and tempest and the flame of devouring fire. All you need to do is to read Third Nephi to see how literally that was fulfilled. I quote from Third Nephi a portion to indicate it. And it came to pass 
in the thirty and fourth year, there arose a great storm, and one and and one as never had been known in all the land. And there was also a great and terrible tempest, and there was terrible thunder, insomuch that it did shake the whole earth, and if it was about as if it were about to divide asunder. And there were uh, exceeding sharp lightnings, such as never had been known in all the land. And the city of Zarahemla did take fire, and the city of Moroni did sink into the depths of the sea, and the inhabitants thereof were drowned. And the earth was carried up upon the city of Moronihah, and in the place of the city there became a great mountain, and there was a great and terrible destruction in the land southward. And then it goes on describing the, de the destruction in that land. No wonder they can find the ruins of cities and cement highways as they delve into the depths of the earth down in that land of Central and South America where these people settled. And um, then he goes on in that same chapter to say, and the vision of it all has become as the words of a book that is sealed, that men give to one who has learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot read a sealed book. Can you find a fulfillment of that anywhere in this world? Like when Martin Harris took copies of the hieroglyphics from the plates from which the Book of Mormon was translated to Professor Anthony in New York. And when he had given a certificate that the translation was correct, and then he wanted Martin Harris to bring the plates and let him translate them, and Martin Harris said, they're sealed. And he reputed the very words that Isaiah spoke thousands of years ago, I cannot read a sealed book. That's what I mean when I say that if the prophecies of, of, of as Peter indicated, are, uh, are, are, I got that one, are not of private interpretation, then there, no one else in the world can interpret these prophecies of Isaiah in this 29th chapter. And then he goes on to say in the 6th chapter, Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with... Well, I don't need to read that. I want to go on. In that same chapter, after saying the vision of it all, that is, of all that he saw about this people and its destruction and the coming forth of their record out of speaking out of the dust, and it have a familiar spirit, I gave a copy of the Book of Mormon to the treasure in the Presbyterian Church back in New Bedford when I was doing missionary work there. And when he'd about finished reading it, I said, as you read that book, that it occurred to you that anyone could have written the contents of that book to deceive people? Oh, he said, Mr. Richards, when I read that book, I get the same spiritual uplift that I get when I read the New Testament. Isn't that what Isaiah meant when he said that it should have a familiar spirit. And then he goes on in that same uh, chapter to say, And the deaf shall know. And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book. What book? The Book of Mormon. And the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. Isaiah didn't understand way back in his day of his own wisdom the theory of the Braille that makes it possible for the blind to read the words of the book. And then Isaiah says in that same chapter, because this people draw near me with their mouths and with their lips to honor me, but their hearts are far removed from me, and they teach for doctrine the precepts of men. Therefore I, the Lord God, will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. I bear you my solemn witness as a, an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ that we have that marvelous work and a wonder, and these prophecies that I've referred to, no one else in all this world could interpret them if we'll take them in the spirit 
in which they were written. May God help us to share the marvelous truths that have come to us in this dispensation through the restoration of the gospel and our knowledge of the Holy Scriptures. I pray and leave you my love and blessing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.